next speaker is Henrik Gomez from PI, and he's talking about timeless quantum gravity, bubbles in shape space. That's right. That it's, wasn't on, I think. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, and I'm sorry about the huge abstract. I hope I won't take as long to give this talk as long as you. Yeah, exactly, just read the abstract. So first, uh, I, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, it's, uh, I really like uh, talking about conceptual issues whenever I can. And sometimes you're very involved in a calculation and there is no real time or, or, or requirement of that and I miss it, so thanks. Um, so right, I'm going to be talking about bubbles in shape space. So let's see what do I mean by that. So first I should uh, start by, by just letting you guys know what are some of the issues that I, I'm trying to address, right? Some of the issues that concern me and uh, I'm not completely sure that they have been phrased in this manner uh, yet here. So uh, I, I think there is a, uh, if you take the quantum mechanical properties of a uh, quantum superposition principle and uh, non-locality of instantaneous measurements, uh, they, it can be said that they clash, right? They clash with the general relativistic properties of a fixed causal structure and space-time covariance. Uh, for example, when you talk about, uh, and this is something that even when I was reading my first books of, of, of physics, uh, I read this great book by Wheeler about general relativity where he talks about curved space-time. It's really beautifully illustrated. And, uh, and then I read some other book about quantum mechanics and he talked about the, the, the double slit experiment. It was by Paul Davis, I think. And uh, already at that time, I think it was beginning college, and I was puzzled by if you have a double slit experiment, uh, which one is sourcing the gravitational field, right? Is it, if you have a superposition of particles, which one is, is actually sourcing the gravitational field? And, and that's something that stuck with me for a while. And uh, so you also, if you, ha you also have problems, even if you go to non-perturbative QFT, and you have this, uh, this property that space-like uh, operators with uh, space-like separated support should commute. But when you have superpositions of gravitational fields, with respect to which ones are they being, uh, are they space-like separated, the supports? You don't know. And it's not very clear how you make sense of these two things together, right? And this, I think Daniela addressed this a little bit. He said, look, you need certain notions of, of time, et cetera, talk about unitarity. And we, uh, before you can, and uh, there's also the, the, the property that we usually think of, of, of measurements as being uh, non-local or they collapse the wave function everywhere, usually in quantum mechanics. And <clears throat> general relativity, you have space-time covariance, right? This is something that's, and uh, these problems still leave out the measurement problem um, in the foundations of, of, of quantum mechanics. And uh, here I will, uh, there is implicit in what I'm going to discuss an attitude towards that measurement problem, but I would love to get philosophers' feedback about that and, and understand better how, how it fails to address uh, or does not fail to address a measurement problem in this uh, context. So let me start very briefly by uh, giving you a picture of these three really nice guys. Uh, I think you probably recognize the first two uh, right, this is Heisenberg and Bohr, and that is Sir Mott. And um, I'm putting this picture up there because around the end of the, the, the 1920s, 28, 29, um, Einstein, the, the, the usual gadfly of, of, of quantum mechanics, um, he posed a, a question to them and said, look, uh, if, uh, if I have a, 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 a radioactive element in a bubble chamber. So this is a chamber full of, 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 of water molecules in, in vapor states. And, and if this alpha particle decays, or there's, there's a radio, radioactive element which releases an alpha particle, it will form linear tracks on this, uh, on this bubble chamber. And how come? Well, because the, the wave function of the alpha particle is spherically symmetric. Right, so his question was basically, so how come I don't get, you know, uh, things like this? And um, so, 
And then these people started addressing it, and, and Heisenberg and Bohr thought of it, thought of the water molecules as being playing the role of a classical observer, basically. So the water molecules for them were was a classical component, and uh, they were collapsing the wave function of the alpha particle. And they showed it that way that it formed linear tracks. But Sermat wasn't happy with that. And um, I don't know if you can read that from over there. But he said, so this, this present note is suggested by Darwin, which is, uh, was uh, Darwin's grandson, in fact, I think. And uh, is intended to show how one of the most typically particle-like properties of matter can be derived from the wave mechanics. So in the theory of radioactive disintegration, as presented by Gamow, the alpha particle is represented by a spherical wave, which slowly leaks out of the nucleus. On the other hand, the alpha particle, once emerged, has particle-like properties, the most striking being the ray tracks that it forms on a Wilson cloud chamber. It is a little difficult to picture how it is that an outgoing spherical wave can produce a straight track. Right? We think intuitively that it should ionize atoms at random throughout the chamber. So here's a, here's a picture, more or less at a time. You can see uh, the, 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 the tracks of, at the gas chamber. And the question is, so why do spherically symmetric wave functions produce collinear rays? And uh, in fact, what Mott did was he, he solved the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, there was no time there. And he showed that excited bubbles do tend to be collinear when you, when you use, uh, I'll, I'll briefly go through the derivation. And, uh, and also farther ones are less likely to be excited than ones close to the center. What is crucial for this uh, demonstration is that, uh, that so, so here is the conclusion, is that approximately classical history appears from a timeless quantum mechanical setting. So this is already uh, of some general interest. And uh, let me just really briefly, I, I won't uh, address everything here, but you can show this by using a perturbative scheme on the interaction between the alpha particle and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the water molecules. Or the, I, the ones that you're going to ionize. And you just model them as two-state detectors, so just basically occupied or unoccupied. And uh, you have the interaction Hamiltonian to be localized on certain points. In, uh, so this, is, this function f is a function that will localize the, the water vapor molecules in the jth position or around the jth position. And then you can solve perturbatively. So this, this right-hand wave function here just says, look, at a perturbative level i, I will have uh, j1 to jj at either occupied or unoccupied position. Because this one, the first one here, psi and tensor product with all the zeros, is the one where no bubble, bubbles are, are, are excited. And you can, use this, this, you can use an iteration procedure to solve it. Um, perturbatively, and so in the end, and this is more or less important, <clears throat> you find that for n bubbles to be excited, what you actually need to do is, so this w here is going to be the Green's function of the free Hamiltonian, and with certain boundary conditions, and this is very important, and what you do is, in fact, you need to propagate from this position here to the previous bubble to, or to another bubble, to another bubble, et cetera, et cetera. So you use the, 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 the free particle Hamiltonian uh, Green's function to, to see how. So basically, you're saying, look, for this to be excited, uh, I need to use some kind of a, a transition amplitude from here to here, and you need to symmetrize. And uh, you see how you, you get the amplitude from concatenating all of these. And, um, but here's what's the important point. And this is what, how Mott derived the linearity of this, is he used the semi-classical approximation. Now, the semi-classical approximation just says the transition amplitude to go from uh, configuration i to configuration j can be decomposed in that form over there, where you have some, some uh, amplitude uh, delta, which is usually called the Van Vleck determinant, and uh, times an exponential of uh, the, that's the basic, well, here it wasn't yet, but that's the Hamilton-Jacobi functional. So it will solve some differential equations when you plug that into the, to the Schrodinger equation. And um, it's, it basically corresponds to, to, to classical trajectories. You see the momenta. So 
these are th the, the, the Hamilton Jacobi functions will form surfaces of uh, an equal phase, basically, of the wave function. And the momenta can be seen as basically the, 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 the differentials of this, of, this constant, uh, of this constant phase functions. So that's what I said pj is, is the, 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 the gradient of the phase function. And um, when you put everything together, and this is just me rewriting that amplitude that I wrote before, you find that stationarity means, so this wave function is peaked, basically as what Francesca was saying, that this wave function is peaked around where the moment, so I could have, it's true that I could have something like this, so I could have, these are the, 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 the particle, the particles that are excited, but in fact, what it shows is that the wave function is only peaks when these are, are collinear, so when the incoming momenta is equal to the outgoing momenta. And uh, so that's, that's how they, they derive that this, 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 uh, this bubble chamber should, should make these tracks. So two things are important here. These are the, the two, two points that I want you to take forward for the rest of the, the talk, is that a boundary condition was important. So there's an origin in configuration space. I didn't show you how or why this is important, but basically, if I didn't have a boundary condition, I couldn't have set the, the, the Green's functions the way I did, and it, it wouldn't, I would have a superposition of all of these, uh, all of these Green's functions, and I, it wouldn't have formed such linear, nicely linear tracks like it did here. So it is important to have this, it, in, in, in this case, it's just set up by spherical symmetry, these boundary conditions. And uh, the semi-classical approximation are the ingredients that yield the formation of this structure. So he, m m my starting point, and I, I don't think this is new, uh, at least in suggesting that it can, it can be a way forward, is uh, to, 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 to use MOT as a, as a starting point to, to solve uh, some conceptual problems in quantum gravity. And um, I think, uh, well, Hartle-Hawking has been mentioned here before, and there are other proposals for having a wave function of the universe. And I think an analogy could be made with the Hartle-Hawking and, and also Vilenkin's tunneling proposal. Right? So, so these proposals, they say, look, that's my wave function of the universe, psi of h. So h here is going to be an instantaneous three metric. So the, and any possible instant of the universe, let's say. And, um, and then you integrate over all possible uh, space times from some given boundary condition, which I here call G naught, and this uh, in instantaneous metric, or this instantaneous three metric. This, this, this yeah, this, um, this uh, three metric H. And uh, for Hartle Hawking, they, they, they actually try to choose uh, this, this one of these boundary conditions to be some kind of Euclidianization where time basically becomes Euclidean, so um, it rounds off as in like a four sphere and the cap of a four sphere. And, and for Villenkin, he just, or at least originally, uh, he wanted to, to be some sort of tunneling, and so he just said, well, I'm just gonna take it universes from nothing. I'm just gonna take G naught as being the completely degenerate metric. So the completely degenerate metric says that you have all these points, but the distance between all, any of them is zero because it's just a, the zero metric. And I would say that it's a many worlds view, but uh, if nobody objects, but, <laughs> uh, right. So what do I like about this approach? Um, well, there, there, there are several things. So I, I do like it that the, <coughs> that the object, <coughs> excuse me, that the label of the wave function are uh, instantaneous three metrics, and, uh, <clears throat> and they form the configuration space. I also do like it that there is an origin, like in the Mott bubble chamber experiment, because I want to be able to have some, some way of, of forming structure from semi-classical approximation of the wave function for the entire universe, and I want to follow a, a Mott in that sense, and also to have some notion of, of records in the way that Mott forms records about past trajectories in a timeless way. <laughs> so it's a lot to ask. And, um, and I, uh, so I also think that a wave function which takes values on instantaneous configurations could soften the conflict 
between covariance and instantaneous measurements. Right? This was my conflict two, if you remember. Uh, and it does work well in systems with high symmetry, mini superspace. Uh, it predicts inflation. I'm, I'm not very comfortable with saying predict after <laughs> you made the, the very uh, correct uh, distinction between postdiction and prediction. It postdicts inflation. Uh, well, although there is uh, still debate about how you take contours of integration and things like that, and something that I won't address here, but are somehow, uh, um, well, in their subtext to what I'm, I'm writing. But I think there are also conceptual issues. Uh, Just a clarification question. Right. It, it also predicts inflation if you have a scale field. Right, 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 right. Yes. Right, but here, since here, so here I'm, I'm just going to, I'm taking a much more uh, bird's eye view of, of the whole topic. So I, I, will be, I won't be looking at particular models with scalar fields or anything. I'm just going to be looking at the whole properties of a system, a closed system, as, as, as you were saying. So, uh, but th there are also conceptual issues. Uh, for instance, the computation of probabilities uh, the Born rule does not seem to be the right choice uh, here as there is no external variable uh, under which to conserve it. And there's also no gl gl global gauge fixing of, of refoliations that we know of in configuration space of gravity, right? So there's no good universal time function configuration space. And it's not clear how to conserve unitarity if you're switching from one notion of time to another if you have different patches. So this is also related to the problem of time. In, in, in quantum gravity. Um, right. So regarding the, the, the boundary conditions, and uh, this is a lit, slightly technical, so I, I, I won't spend too much time in it, but the way that, you, that one does the, write the path integral more explicitly, uh, this is basically done by uh, Taito Boehm in one paper and then um, Harto and Halliwell in another is you can do consider uh, all the histories. So you consider all possible histories, and then you use a delta function. So this is h of t that I wrote there. Uh, and you, then you use a delta function to say that all of these initial points are the same, or all the final points are the same. Here I'm keeping fixed one of the points. So I'm fixing all these trajectories to end up at the same point through a delta function. And those, and that uh, big delta there, and uh, and the functional delta are gauge fixings and Fade Popov determinants. Th these are things to make sure that you can do this gauge, do a gauge fixing of the path integral. So the path integral is not uh, it ha has non-degenerate propagators and all of that, but you can do it in a gauge invariant way. This is what the Fade Popov uh, determinant is there. There are many complications to do this in GR. Because, especially in this, in this way, in this three plus one way, because, well, maybe I don't know how much you guys are interested in this, but there's a, a problem there because in, in GR, the constraint, doesn't, the constraint algebra is not a real algebra. So this is not a real determinant. So usually a determinant like a Jacobian, it would be perfect to change coordinates because it compensates things that you would, extra things that you'd get on the change of coordinates. But in this case, it's not a real determinant. So you need to use more complicated methods like a, a, a fradkin vikovsky method, et cetera. But my point here is that regarding the boundary conditions in the path integral, uh, so for instance, suppose, so suppose this is the space, the, the, the board is the space of all three metrics. And uh, the space of the, 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 the positive three metrics, so the actual three metrics. So suppose the board is the space, sorry, of all the symmetric uh, tensors. Uh, zero two covariant tensors. The actual space of the, the positive three metrics is like a cone inside this because you can, you can add two three metrics and you still get a three metric, but if you subtract two of them, you can get out of the, of the, the space of, of positive three metrics. And on the border, these three metrics are degenerate. So in the original paper by Hartle and Hawking, they, they actually postulate uh, conditions on the path integral. They say, well, the, our paths can, it could never, uh, can never cross. Basically, they say uh, we want our wave function to be zero on these, on these curves here, on the, the, 
where the determinant of the three metric would become degenerate. So where the three metric no longer describes a slice of space, let's say, right? It now is, is some, can be, uh, can have different signatures or be degenerate and you'd get change of topology of that. So maybe, you know, it's not so bad. But in any case, um, they say that, but of course this is not, a con this is not meaningful from a space-time perspective. Because uh, space-time, if you do a, a, suppose one of these curves crosses this point here, but if I do a refoliation, so this is the space of three metrics, right? And suppose I have a space-time here, and if I do a refoliation, uh, now this curve might not cross anymore or do something else. So y you need to bring in a lot of machinery to, to make sense of, of, of these things that I'm saying. But, uh, and, and my second uh, criticism of, uh, as regards, regards the boundary condition is that there seems to be no consensus on what is the origin for a configuration space or what is the origin of this wave function. So you have the Willenkin proposal, you have the hart hawking proposal, you have also Andre Linde's proposal, which is uh, something related to the Willenkin proposal. Right, so now finally, to what uh, more towards my, my, my area of expertise is I, I think there are new considerations that you can bring to bear on, on, on these problems, which is uh, shape space and, and its topology. So this relates to something called uh, shape dynamics, which probably none of you have heard about, but uh, I have a lot. And, and, uh, it's, uh, and it's basically, so, Okay, so if, let's suppose I start with a demand that I want a separation between a physical law and the objects that the law acts on. This is very abstract, but uh, it basically means that I want a separation between evolution and initial values, right, that are taken to be fundamental. So I, I want to say that an initial value formulation of a theory is actually more important than a covariant formulation of a theory. It's more fundamental, that the covariance uh, is not a fundamental property of, of any theory that I, that I, that I want, that it, but it should be an emergent property, relationally, let's say. Um, so uh, this type of formulation, it is indeed more sympathetic to, to, to instantaneous objects, like uh, I, I want to, to be more compatible with certain notions of quantum mechanics. And then the second thing that I want is that I want to only have relational access to these objects the law acts on. So, for example, if I have, you know, so let's say I, I have these two markers and uh, these are the objects that any law will act on, they're already acting, etc. But I only want thing, I only want quantities that are relational to make sense uh, of the theory. So, for instance, the relative size should be, should be an object that the theory acts on. So I can only talk meaningfully about the size of this marker with respect to something else and so on. And also position in space should also be relational. I can only talk about position of something relative to something else. And this is what I mean here by relationalism. And if I implement relationalism for the objects that my theory will act on, uh, in my case, this will imply spatial scale invariance and spatial diffeomorphisms. So the fundamental theory that I want is required from my relational principles to have these two sorts of symmetries. Um, so unlike GR, as I will show in this case, there is a reduced configuration space. So for GR, you, you don't know how to get to the space of initial values for, for GR. You don't know how to reduce uh, the configuration space of GR by refoliations. There is no, no, you can only find initial values for GR. For instance, the most generic one is for CMC data, for constant mean curvature data. And this is exactly what shape dynamics covers, the case that shape dynamics covers. So I'm not gonna get too much in shape dynamics, but let me just tell you that you can formulate GR as a theory. Let me rephrase that. You can formulate most solutions of GR as a theory that takes place in, in conformal superspace, so in the space of shape dynamics. It's a theory that has three-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance and three-dimensional scale invariance, not uh, full space-time covariance. But 
Unfortunately, this talk is not about shape dynamics, so I won't have too much time to get into it. We can discuss it afterwards. It has other problems. The theory has other issues, but it has a large intersection with GR solutions, and it can be phrased like that. It has a non-local Hamiltonian and other problems. But um, because the theory doesn't care about, local, about absolute size, it only cares about relative sizes, we call it shape dynamics, or this would be shape space. Uh, so the, the configuration space of the theory, the reduced configuration space of the theory is called conformal superspace. Superspace is the space of all three-dimensional geometries, so three metrics quotiented by spatial diffeomorphisms, and shape space is when you also quotient by uh, scale transformations. Okay, so let's take a breather and uh, let me have a quick summary of the points that you, I want you to, 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 to remember from what I, I said until now. So I, I <clears throat> one of the points is that I think mod bubbles can form the illusion of history from a timeless setting, but it needs good boundary conditions. The other thing is that uh, hartle hockey and Villenkin could be an instantiation of mod for the universe and uh, also with scalar fields predicting inflation. But there are conceptual issues as a fundamental theory in uh, regards to probabilities and boundary conditions. And, uh, and I think shape dynamics has a well-defined reduced configuration space, which is the space of conformal three geometries. And uh, it doesn't need a gauge fixing of refoliations because refoliations are not part of the local symmetries of the theory, of the fundamental local symmetries of the theory. So the questions that you could pose is, of course, after I've said this, is can it overcome the covariant obstructions to the, to the boundary conditions? And does it provide a consistent notion of probabilities and uh, resolve some of the conflicts and, and help me sleep at night? So this is, uh, I, 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 I'm sure I won't have time to cover all of this, but maybe the three first items, I will try to uh, tell you how, how the, the theory is constructed so that there's no non-unitary measurement process. I don't think there's a notion of that here. Uh, we'll uniquely obtain a Born rule as a volume element in reduced configuration space, and then time, including space time, will emerge as an effective concept, uh, very much in the same notion as the, 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 in the Mott bubble chamber. I, I, I hope to explain you uh, more about that. And uh, these last two points I won't get to. So let's go to the wave function in reduced configuration space and the fundamental asymmetry of shape space. Okay, so, so, so the general prerequisites for the constructions that I, that I have, uh, they, they, they can be quite broad. Uh, I will use them in a particular instantiation, so uh, I will use them for shape dynamics. But in fact, I could say that I have some set which encodes a weak notion of locality, neighborhoods. Uh, so maybe it's a network, although I haven't really tried to, to translate this to, to, to spin network or, or anything of the sort. And uh, in, in my case, it will be a closed topological manifold, so it will be just S3, just a three sphere. And then I'll give the set of all possible field configurations over this manifold, right? So the example that I have, for example, uh, here that I'm going to be using is the space of all uh, three metrics on this S3, on this uh, three-sphere. And then what, what will I require of my symmetry group? Uh, before even speaking of the action, I will require something of the symmetries that my theory will, will have to uh, obey. So this is before talking about the dynamics, I already have the symmetries. The symmetries in my case, or in what I want to say, they, they come already at a kinematical level. They're more fundamental than the dynamical symmetries or the symmetries of the action, which will, 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 will arise as well, which will be obligated from this. Uh, so one of the things that I want is that my local gauge group has to act locally in the, in the, in the physical manifold M and pointwise in configuration space. So you can see here, uh, any symmetry here will only depend on the point and it, you can project down. You can project down to a base space of each fiber of these symmetries. Uh, this is something that you can't do with the configuration space of GR. Refoliations don't allow this kind of, of projection. 
Um, so this is, if, for those of you who are familiar, this is a fiber bundle picture. Right? And I take these orbits of all the three metrics that are equivalent under my symmetry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, by the way, and um, so for, for if I use metric variables, it's uh, already very restrictive to have a symmetry that acts over the whole of, uh, of, of the space of three metrics in this manner. You can have spatial diffeomorphisms and uh, spatial scale transformations and only a spurious type of, of symmetry transformation that I, I, I don't really know how to characterize. So it's, it's very difficult to find things that, that make sense. Uh, besides giving you the structure of geometry and conformal geometry. Um, right. But more than that, and this is crucial, is that I will assume that there exists a unique orbit uh, corresponding to the most homogeneous element. So let me, let me go back once. So here you have this quotienting, right? But I have points here, I, have, I can have points in this, in this physical, in this configuration space that uh, have certain subgroups under which they don't move. These are isotropy subgroups. So for instance, if I take a point here that corresponds to the three sphere, I'll have some subgroup of the, the, the diffeomorphisms that don't move it, all the isometries of the three sphere, right? They won't move the point around because the, the rotations don't change the three metric. And, uh, and, and you have different, uh, you have different uh, orders of, of these types of isotropy groups. In fact, and well, I, I'm, I'm gonna get to it, but well, I, can, I, can, I think I can show you now. So for, for spatial diffeomorphisms, what happens is already something quite cute, is that this reduction, because it acts differently in different points, so certain fibers have more isometry content than others. When you take a reduction, when you're quotienting out by this vertical direction, it changes from point to point how much you quotient out because there's the different degrees of symmetry. So the, 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 the base manifold, in fact, it doesn't form a manifold. It forms something called a stratified manifold. And you can think of a stratified manifold as a concatenation of manifolds of different dimensionality. So you have, as in a cube, you have you know, a manifold that is the bulk of the cube and those corresponds, let's say, to the metrics that have no symmetry. And then you have the face of the cube which would corresponds to metrics that have slightly higher symmetry and this higher symmetry up to a point. Right. So in my case, the, the, uh, what I would like to have is a, uh, uh, assume that there exists a unique, uh, a unique orbit, so a unique one of those points that corresponds to the homo most homogeneous element. Because I want to have some physical statement about that origin of, of configuration space. So just like Hartel Hawking, they have the, the, this half uh, Euclidean sphere, and uh, Villenkin has this universe from nothing or the completely degenerate metric. I want to have a general uh, criteria for where I'm going to anchor my wave function. And uh, my general criteria is this, is that I will want to anchor it in the, in the, in the subset which has the highest isotropy group under, the, under, under my gauge, under my local gauge symmetries. Uh, so in, in the cases that I will look at, which are conformal uh, diffeomorphisms uh, on S3, there will be a unique such point, which will be the, the round three sphere. And, and I'm going to talk to you about this. If there are more, if there is a set, then I will need an initial wave function in this set, and this is another topic. But. And I also need some sort of pre-probability uh, function. So this is just something that takes you from the complex numbers and goes into the, the positive uh, real numbers. And uh, it will just give me a probability density after I've defined my sort of hartel hawking or, or transition amplitude from this anchor point, from this most homogeneous point. So this is the same thing that has the least amount of structure possible, this anchor point, uh, to any other point. As, after I define this wave function, I will also need something to give me probabilities from this wave function. And I need it to satisfy this, uh, this, this property here. And uh, it will be necessary to, for my notion of records, for, for it to have the same property as the Mott bubble chamber, it, it, it needs to satisfy this property here my amplitude, so, okay. 
So this, I, I think I'm going to have to skip. Uh, it's about how I construct my path integral using a, a structure of this vibration, which is, a, is basically an infinite dimensional gauge connection to, to only to, to have a prescription of how to lift paths from base space to, to the, the field space. So it's a horizontal lift of, of field paths or field histories. Um, and I, there's a well-defined measure defined by Barvinsky for theories of this sort. Um, ba, ba, ba. And right, so this is just, this is just a, a definition of my transition amplitude for my preferred uh, representative of the, of the initial orbit, of the anchor orbit to any other. And I define a, a, a transition amplitude here uh, with an action. You, you don't need to know uh, exactly the properties of this. But I will also define a static volume form in the reduced configuration space. And this is why I need my function f, right? So my this is just, if you were to take f just to be the, ampli uh, the norm squared, this would be the Born rule, OK? This would be the Born rule on this amplitude that I have defined. But I don't want to assume that it's the Born rule yet. I only assume that other condition that it, that it factorizes, that this function factorizes. And here, Q0 is the most homogeneous configuration. So here's the, 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 the I can show you why uh, for the group of, of conformal diffeomorphisms, um, the, the, the three sphere is the unique uh, such uh, element with the highest isotropy subgroup. Um, I don't think I, I, I have time to actually show it well. But uh, you can see that. With the, the notion of parallel of, of horizontal lift that I that I that I give, you can never reach. Uh, so suppose you have a curve in base space, and I want to lift it to. So this is my, my full configuration space, and the way that I said that I would lift it is by horizontal lift, and it's very easy to show that to my notion of horizontal lift, uh, these curves can never reach the generate metrics. So you don't need to impose more boundary conditions on the path integral. And uh, it, it's also easy to show that for, um, that, so since the generate metrics are not reachable, uh, they're, kind of, they're disconnected from the rest of, of, of this uh, reduced phase space. And so the, the, the group elements with the highest isotropy groups will be the three spheres. Uh, because, so if I only had diffeomorphisms, if I only had spatial diffeomorphisms, then I would have the completely degenerate metric would be the one with the highest isotropy subgroup. Um, and this gives me Villenkin's tunneling wave function. So if I had chosen the group just as the, 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 the diffeomorphisms, right? And if I have the completely degenerate metric, the completely degenerate metric is invariant under any diffeomorphism. So you have the whole group uh, as acting as, a, as an isotropy over the completely degenerate metric. So if I only have the diffeomorphisms, then I can define um, unambiguously this point, because it is invariant just under the, the three diffeomorphisms. What doesn't leave it invariant are refoliations. You can change the, the, the completely determinant metric under refoliations. Um, but then, so, but in my case, since I also want the conformal transformations, this, this completely determinant metric wouldn't be allowed. I would only have the three sphere. Um, right. So I would have the Villenkin condition, but it would only match really Villenkin if I, if, if I would only have the, the, the spatial diffeomorphism. So the full theory would have less degrees of freedom, would have a scalar graviton or something like that. It would only match Villenkin if you're a mini superspace, because then you, you already don't have these, these, these local uh, degrees of freedom. You're already global in any case. Right. So in this case, it matches Villenkin's proposal. Um, Right, so let me give a summary of this subsection. I have defined general conditions under which a reduced configuration space is available. And this is basically, you want your symmetry group to act pointwise in configuration space. So it only, so for instance, the action of the diffeomorphisms, of the spatial diffeomorphisms on a metric, they just act as, so this is the generator of the group, or just as the lead derivative uh, at the metric itself. If you were to take refoliations, for example, they don't just depend on G. They also depend on G dot. So if I were to isolate them, they would depend on the lapse times G dot as they act on the metric. 
So it depends not only on the point, but also on, 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 on tangents at that point. So, and when you have this pointwise action, you can take quotients. You can, you can use the, redu the, the space of physical observables, basically. So this is the space of physical observables. This is a space of conformal three geometries. And uh, under more restrictive conditions, I found a unique corner. So uh, in the sense of this, of this thing here, where this, this point represents, um, represents the configuration with the most amount of symmetries, so the most homogeneous one. And in my case, it's unique, and you don't need to put any more boundary conditions on, on the wave function. Um, right, so probabilities. So something that uh, people have, I think, been using implicitly is the um, semi-classical approximation for oscillatory path integrals. And you, when you have extreme on paths, so paths that extremize an action that I'm, I'm also, in the end, assuming that it lives on, on reduced configuration space, so it does have that, those symmetries that I have. Um, you have some, this thing which is called the von Vleck determinant, and you have a semi-classical, uh, 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 the semi-classical approximation gives you an amplitude in terms of the on-shell action. So this is the action that, uh, the on-shell action is the actual action over a solution of the field, of the field equations, right? Um, and here, so you can actually separate what are interference effects. So suppose I have two points here. This is QI and this is QF. And I will have many extremal paths and uh, or many paths that satisfy the equations of motion, but let's say. I can find the transition amplitude from here to here as basically satisfying, as basically just calculating interference over classical paths. Uh, so that's the exp of the, the hamilton jacobi functional, that's the phase. And they're modulated by something that's called the von Vleck determinant. They're mod they have some sort of thickness or spread. And I, will, I actually will you need to use this. Um, I don't have much time. Right. So I haven't justified yet taking the, 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 the Born rule. So, right, so what is the meaning of this, of this modulation? What is the meaning of what I call the, the, the von Vleck determinant? The meaning of this is, is that it, if you only had, let's say I have QI and QF, and I have a, a small volume of configuration space around here and a small volume of configuration space around here, and I want to say, how, if I take only the classical paths, how much do they focus or, or how much do they dilute and I transport this volume element here, how much do they dilute the volume element from one point to another? This is, the, this is the definition of the von Vleck determinant. And what I want is for my transition amplitude at the classical level to reproduce this classical notion of classically transporting volumes in configuration space. And it turns out when you, I'm not gonna show you the proof, which is quite simple, but it turns out when you require my F to reproduce the classical uh, transportation of, 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 of these volume elements in configuration space, the only possible F that you can get is the one that, uh, that gives you the, the Born rule for, for this wave function. Right. And uh, now I, I have a timeless picture. I need to tell you how I, well, how I think about uh, records or how do I think about this point in time here as having a, a notion of time, uh, of records between here and the Big Bang, let's say, or, or in this case here and, uh, and this anchor. And so the notion that you can have is that I, I will call a record if all the extremal, pa all the extremal uh, paths, so all the paths that extremize the, the, the path integral. So this, is, this drawing is a little bit more complicated but because here I use the coarse graining. Uh, of the path, so, but you can just imagine it at some limit when the, the action of the path is much greater than, than, the, than H bar. They all have to cross on the same point. So imagine this is the, the, the anchor, the origin of the universe, or whatever you want to call. It's, it's, it's all static. And imagine this is the present moment now, or this is the configuration space. I don't know if everybody can see this. Now imagine that I have all possible extremal trajectories. And all extremal trajectories that went from here to here actually cross the same point. 
then you can show that the transition amplitude as I defined anchored, so the transition amplitude here, it decomposes in a transition amplitude from going from here to here, and then a transition amplitude from going from here to here at the semi-classical level. So that means by my, my, my attributes that the probability also decomposes. So the probability for this final configuration here or the volume element on this final configuration here, it decomposes and depends, it's conditional on the volume element of this, of this uh, recorded configuration here. So I think of that configuration in the middle as somehow being a record of, uh, or recorded in the last configuration, all right? Although I think of this physically as having here, for example, uh, a photograph of the experiment that we were, we, we were having. So a record is, is, a record is a property of this final configuration here, a record of a different configuration. Uh, but what you get out of this is that you get a notion of conditional probability like in the Mott bubble chamber. So if you have multiple records, records of records of records, you find the transition, the semi-classical transition probability behaves in the same way as I showed you for the Mott bubble chamber. So the probability of, a, uh, of, this, uh, of this final phi here, it decomposes as conditional probability of all of these having been excited. So as in the Mott bubble chamber experiment, it would mean like if I want to have this bubble here excited, it's actually conditional on all the, the, these other bubbles being excited and it, it decomposes, it factorizes in the transition between all of these. And uh, right, so this is one configuration. So this is a, so th th these two, so this is an origin here, this is an origin here, and this is a record of this. So here, this is a record, this configuration is a record of that one. And I could have more. Um, for the first three cases, I have records. For the other one, no, because the, the, the ordering between the extremal paths doesn't match between the, the different records. So anyways, that's a more complicated thing. And I can also, then I would also talk about the conditional probabilities because when um, probability has a record, I, and I quotient it, the transition amplitude between the anchor and the record itself factors out. So I don't need to know everything that happened uh, to the universe before I set up the, 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 the initial conditions of my laboratory or, or something like that, although I haven't really talked about subsystems. So here there's no time, but we still want to define conservation of probability. So I'm thinking of these things, of the wave, wave function and everything as actually defining a volume form over reduced configuration space. So really think of it as a volume form. And this volume form has this property that it, that it uh, relates volumes at certain points with volumes at different points. And um, so uh, since I don't have a notion of conservation of probability, I need some, some, some notion of, uh, of, of, uh, of, well, of time, but, uh, which is imp implemented by the records. But now I don't want, so for instance, if I have, imagine I have all, all of these configurations here have a record of this configuration here, right? But I don't know how to talk about conservation of probabilities because here I have many redundant records. I have this, so this is a record, this is a record of this, these two are records of this. So I, can, I'm, I'm, I might be over counting probabilities or volume forms if I count all of these things that are uh, related basically are in the same classical trajectory. So what you want is to, is to basically cut across these things as you would usually do with a time function in configuration space. There is a, a particular way of, of, of expressing that here. And, um, and you can also show that the, this, this flux of volume basically is always bigger on the records than on, the, on these screens that I define. So I, I'm not gonna be able to, have to show this, but in the end, um, so in the end, you, you get, if you, even if you do a, a, a matter, uh, if you separate matter degrees of freedom from uh, the gravitational degrees of freedom and you put the gravitational degrees of freedom as heavier, in simple models that I have for, which does, I mean, these are also kind of mini superspace, more or less, but uh, you also, also find that the notion of time that records define along this, uh, along this line um, they will serve 
as a kind of Schrodinger time for the, the, the wave function of matter degrees of freedom that are, 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 are coupled to, to, to the geometry. Um, right, uh, I think I'm, I'm almost over, so I don't have much. Uh, so, in a semi-classical approximation, uh, we have shown that the Born density is unique among the ones that uh, admit an interpretation of records as conditional probabilities and reduce to the classical propagation of volumes in configuration space. And here I don't have fundamental time, so the Born rule can't give conservation of probability. Uh, however, probability can be conserved between records and, and their screens, what I call sections of configurations which have the same records but are not records of each other. So there are no redundant records. It's like a time function. And I have also shown that uh, weak matter couplings uh, can have a st uh, standard Schrodinger wave equation for the matter in the background ordering given by the semi-classical records along a single gravitational solution, so I can't have interference between different uh, gravitational solutions to have this interpretation as a Schrodinger equation in the background. And um, so, I mean, I can go back to the Sleeping Beauty if you want, but let me conclude, because I, I think this is interesting if you guys want to discuss it, because I, I put this here because it's more prone to philosophical discussions. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Sleeping Beauty uh, paradox. But um, so just a quick remark is that in like, like in Hart and Hawking, I, I, I hear I impose boundary conditions. In, there they impose controversial boundary conditions in superspace. Here I impose more well-defined boundary conditions in conformal superspace. Of course, I would have to apply this to shape dynamics, not to, to GR. But there is a large intersection between the two. And uh, I would derive space times from a WKB approximation, uh, as in as in Hart and Hawking, just from the semi-classical, just from the semi-classical approximation that I wrote. But unlike Hart and Hawking, here there's a reduced configuration space outside of the mini superspace approximation, and, and and that makes it makes objects easier to 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 translate into having physical meaning. And uh, also, unlike Hart and Hawking, as, as I said before, it has a natural boundary condition on shape space, which naturally correspond to, to the most homogeneous ones, which basically you could say it has the least number of <coughs> excited modes, for example. And it's also a corner. It's also a geometrical corner of reduced configuration space, which I find funny. So, so uh, uh, a nice project that I've, we, we, we started is a context in which general relativity matches shape dynamics is when you write Bianchi 9 and you quotient out uh, global scale by only taking uh, ratios of, 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 of coordinates in, in Bianchi 9. And uh, then you can single out the, the three sphere as the anchor and actually uh, calculate what this, uh, this, this wave function would give for, for Bianchi 9 for this. And uh, so in, in this context, uh, so this is my last slide, uh, I do think that this, uh, that, that this, the, 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 quanti the, the initial conflict that I was mentioning, that I have the, the quantum mechanical notions of no collapse of, uh, so in this case, it's just a static wave function, right? It's just one volume form. There's no real collapse of the wave function because it's a closed system. There's no, uh, well, there's no measurements in a sense. Um, so there's a true fake evolution <laughs> in the semi-classical approximation, and uh, the quantum superposition principle do mix better uh, with a theory where refoliation is not fundamental, but it can be recovered relationally. I haven't talked about this, but th th this is one of the issues, how you recover refoliation dynamically. And, um, uh, and it, it, the Hamiltonian of shape dynamics does separates local gauge symmetries and global evolution. That's why it recovers refoliation and dynamically. And here you, you can have a superposition of different causal structures, for example, because they just mean a causal structure is just formed on an extremal path in shape space or configuration space. And if you have another one that, uh, in, that crosses that and suppose, so, for one of these, you're going to have, you know, the volume form is going to be peaked on this, and the volume form is going to be peaked on this, but you can turn out that this configuration here has very little volume form, and uh, it, it corresponds to interference in, in shape space. And uh, in a sense, causal structures don't superpose, but they can interfere. That's what I mean. And so the challenge is to recover uh, standard GR. Uh, uh, 
I think we can do this in, in simplified models because we use shape dynamics, but it's hard to use shape dynamics more broadly because its equations of motion are, are very complicated uh, are usually. Well, there are different, there are more modern approaches now that uh, take different equations of motion, but uh, the original one, they are non-local, so you need to, to do all sorts of approximations and things like that. So, right, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Starting with this talk, questions? Yes. Um, I, this wonderful talk, I, I was uh, really learned a lot from it, but um, there are many things also I missed. So, uh, just a quick question about the general framework of thinking. Is, is it applicable in its fullness without deforming it too much to a simpler context than GR? So, could we, as it were, go through the steps in, in a simpler context where we have a reasonably good understanding? Uh, right, so I'm sure you could. The problem, so for uh, Villain, so for the villain King tunneling proposal, it's still GR, but uh, you do get the, the, the usual wave function. So here's the issue for me uh, about applying to different contexts is defining this, 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 this isotropy subgroups, or how do you define this anchor point for the wave function? And for that, for instance, uh, I, I don't really know how to single it out, this, this initial point, if you don't include gravitational degrees of freedom. It seems there, well, maybe you can. Uh, to be completely honest, I haven't thought that much about it. So, okay, for n particle systems, you can also do it. So for, and this gives you, um, I, I think this will give you, so there's a work by, by um, Kozlovsky, Mirkati, and, and, and Dave Sloan, and uh, they, have, uh, they have studied, they have started studying uh, applications of, of not exactly this, but the, the formulation of the system as anchored in a, in, a, in a point which would have the highest isotropy group as well here. Um, this would be a second part to the paper that is now online. And uh, I don't know exactly what they have there, but in a sense, doing it for Bianchi 9 is, is, is simple, uh, right? It is, it is kind of like a particle system. I mean, Julian always sets it up in shape space with just the triangular space. You know, right. Particles. So that might seem like a simple model where you could go through the quantum mechanics right. and, and deal with the, the quantum measurement problem aspect of it in a very transparent way. Which is the right. Uh, so this is very recent, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's not. Uh, this iteration, or, or, or these things that I put here, they're not even on the archive yet. So, but I, I, I really do want to look at, so Edward Anderson also has some uh, quantization models for the, these particle systems. I want to match it with that, see how to single out these anchor point and, and things like that. But the fact is that it does match, at least in simple super, mini superface model, you can explicitly match it with Villenkin, for example. It's not a shape space, so it's not satisfactory for us, but uh, you could match it in that context. Questions? Yes. Uh, this may be rather unrelated, but does it in any way have any connection to the Feynman path integral where you have the in principle trajectories interfering and you are able to actually get an optimal? Right, it, it does. These are the, if you think of trajectories, instead of thinking of trajectories of particles in space, you think of trajectories of geometries in configuration space. And then you can have interference of, of, of these things in, in configuration space. But the problem is there that you don't, in usual trajectories you have a, an external time, right? That, and then you have certain properties. If you're just in configuration space, time should already be included inside the, the degrees of freedom that are there as well, the matter degrees of freedom, et cetera. But, but here time will emerge even if you try to Right, so it will emerge in certain circumstances, not always. It will emerge when I have the emergence of records. Right? So for certain configurations, which somehow form, uh, they have a certain structure that you can interpret as having time, and you can interpret uh, 
various things like the, the, the yeah. having a second go, but um, and so many interesting things. Um, just, just on the issue of refoliation, recovering refoliation rates, um, is that, as it were, or kind of like this, is it that underlying the appearance of a Minkowskian structure, there is a genuine uh, privileged foliation, say York time, or is it that it's, it, one, as it were, fixes a gauge it's convenient for calculation. So what's the status of, of the... Right. So, so, so your time, usually it is used as convenient. If in the point, from the point of view of GR, it is used as a convenient tool for calculation. It's, it's the one where you can generically prove uh, the existence of uh, the, the initial value formulation. So well, poseness, et cetera. So from the, the point of view of, of standard shape dynamics, that's not, the, the, the view is different. The view is you construct solutions of a system in, in shape space, and we know of a, of, of a way to translate that into a space time relationally. So you couple weakly back reacting matter fields and so on. And then you reconstruct the space time from that. And you can match this space-time to space-times that have complete York foliations or CMC foliations. But it can break down as well. And in certain cases, it does break down. So for instance, as I was mentioning this work, uh, you can have a solution of uh, in-shape space where if you try to, 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 to raise it to GR, you would, f you would find that, the, 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 that no solution of GR can actually extend over the solution of, of the shape space. You need to glue two solutions of GR uh, together, which, which is not a solution where they joined here. So there's some subtlety to, to these things. Right, from one perspective, York time is, is a convenience tool. From our perspective, it's, all, it's not fundamental as well. It's something that you use to, tr to try to, to explicitly match it with GR. But uh, I also want to extend it beyond the need for, for, for York time, and, and Tim, Kozlovsky is also doing some work on that, so there's, there's a lot of material there.